is John here with uh, what I hope will be the first of a few videos talking about repairs because I know that quite a few of you have said it'd be interesting to know about what repair work goes on and, and how it's done. So uh, I thought in this video I would explain to you about what I've been working on recently which is this particular machine. Uh, give you a bit of a tour of the machine because it's uh, one that's not currently on display in the museum so you might not have seen it before and just talk to you about some of the techniques I've used to repair it. Um, the museum has actually been given four of these uh, and none of them work. So I've had my work cut out to uh, to get them going. So far of the four, I've got three working. This is actually the second one. It's not completely finished yet in terms of restoration. Got quite a bit more to do cosmetically on it. So I've not even cleaned it yet. Um, but I can talk to you about what I've done and the general principles behind it. So what is this machine? It's uh, an Acorn wrist PC from 1994. And basically what this machine is, is an updated version of Acorn's previous Archimedes machine, which came out in 1990, 1987. Um, and the reason why they needed to update it was because Windows PCs were becoming much, much better during the 90s, really transformed and were taking over the, uh, the market really. And minority computers such as this were getting squeezed out and also other even more popular computers like the Amiga and the Atari ST were, were struggling to compete as well. So you can sort of think of this machine as being similar to the Atari Falcon or later models of the Amiga in that it's a, an updated version of a, of a previously quite successful product uh, but one that was increasingly struggling to find customers. It makes it quite interesting. Um, they were sold into schools primarily, so they would have been quite common in schools, but outside of schools, fairly unusual. Um, I'll switch this one on. So it uses an operating system which actually is entirely on ROM, so it doesn't need to access the hard disk very much when booting up, uh, and it boots straight into the desktop, which looks like this and it's actually very similar to a normal Archimedes machine they didn't have a huge amount of money to spend on on upgrading the operating system but um, it's got all the usual sort of features so it's got a floppy disk drive it's got various applications that are actually built in to the ROM so you don't even have to load those off the hard disk and then everything else is here on on the hard disk um, this particular machine seems to have been used in an office environment because currently it has no games on it at all. It's just sort of office productivity type applications, word processors, spreadsheets, that sort of thing. It does have some pictures on it. If I go to images. And this sort of shows what distinguishes this machine from older Archimedes. It has much better graphics, 24 bit color, and very high resolutions up to about 1,000, you know, 1,000 by 768, something like that. Um, so this was a big step forward, but it was just really keeping it competitive with the, the best um, PCs and Macs that were around at the time. So what have I had to do to repair these machines? Well, when I got them, I didn't even bother to switch them on because I basically knew they wouldn't work. Um, these machines are notorious for having one specific problem, which I can show you using a, a spare motherboard that I've got here. So this is the motherboard. And just to give you a quick tour around it, I mean, the first thing to notice is it's quite small uh, because by this point in the 90s, um, miniaturization of the components had got to a really quite good level. So if we look over here, these are the slots for the ROMs. So that would be the, the whole operating system would be on there. These slots are for the processors. The processors on this machine actually come on a daughter board. And there are two slots because you can have two processors and they can be different. In fact, they, they usually would be different. Uh, the main processor goes in this slot and would be um, some variant of an ARM processor. This particular machine is a, is a strong ARM. I think it's at 233 megahertz. 
The second slot is basically for a 486. So you can put a 486 coprocessor into these machines and then it will run Windows. Unfortunately, I can't demonstrate that on this particular machine because it needs some software to do that and the software is not on the hard disk. So I need to add that on there. Um, over here, we've got uh, SIM slots for memory. And this machine can take up to 256 megabytes of memory, which for an Acorn machine is far more than you would ever need. And then there's IDE bus here and floppy drive connector there. These two chips are part of the ARM chipset. That's video and that one is sort of general stuff to make the machine work. This slot here is for a backplane, which you can use to have um, expansion cards plugged into the machine. So this one is one of the spare motherboards and it looks physically in really good condition, but it doesn't work. I haven't finished fixing this one yet. Um, the reason why I knew it wouldn't work is because these machines have an onboard battery which goes here and it's soldered onto the motherboard. This one, obviously I've desoldered it, but that battery over time leaks and the, uh, the alkali inside it gets all over the motherboard and tends to destroy traces in this area and can also cause chips to, to fail. The main one that fails is this one here, which is uh, the memory that stores the clock and all the settings for the computer. So without that, it doesn't know how to start up properly. Those usually need to be replaced. I haven't actually replaced this one yet because it possibly works, but as I say, I haven't finished fault finding on it yet. Now what's happened on this one is the traces around these components here have been eaten away and also fatally around this one, uh, you get damage as well and, and that stops the machine from working. Now I've actually fixed all the damage on this one, but it still doesn't work and I don't know why. Um, I'll show you another motherboard that I've got here. So in the same area on this one, the damage was worse and the traces have disappeared completely. So I've actually had to add some wires and it's basically a case of, of soldering them on to, to bridge the gaps. How do I know where those gaps are? Um, fortunately for this machine, we have full set of schematics. There's seven pages. This is the page around that battery area. And it's really just a case of looking at the schematic, noting which pin is meant to be connected to which other pin or which other component, and then just using um, multimeter in uh, continuity mode to connect those two points, see if they're connected. If they're not connected, put in a wire to, to connect them up. You'll also notice that what I've done is add a, a new battery holder, which is now separate from the motherboard. So if the battery leaks in future, it won't cause any more damage. This one, again, should work, but it doesn't. So I need to do a bit more fault finding on it. The main other thing I ought to mention is when you get these, when they've got all the, the battery leakage on them, this area will be covered with sort of horrible, crusty crystals, green crystals, that sort of thing. I don't think there's any left on here now because I basically washed them off. And, and washing them off is as simple as it sounds. I spray it with vinegar. You get a lot of fizzing uh, as the vinegar neutralizes the alkali. And then I just run it under the tap, um, wash it all off and then leave it in the oven on a, like a warm setting like 40 degrees or something for a few hours. That dries everything out. And that's a perfectly okay thing to do. Um, I wouldn't do it if the motherboard was working, obviously, you know, just for the fun of it. But when it's completely eaten away like that, you've got nothing to lose. So I've used that technique successfully to get three of them working. These two are the last two that I haven't got going yet. This one looks great, so it's annoying that it doesn't work. This one is in a relatively bad state, but I still feel optimistic we'll get that going at some point. Okay, well, I hope that's been interesting. And uh, if you let me have any feedback on the video, uh, I'll see if I can make some more in future. Okay, cheerio, bye.